Welcome to an evening of conversation and learning with Materials for the Arts uh, and our artist this evening, Sean Leonardo. I'm John Cloud Kaiser. I'm the Education Director at Materials for the Arts in New York City. And if you're not aware, we're this program that collects reused materials from the community and then distributes those materials to artists and to community-based artists and to educators in the whole New York City area to make possible all sorts of projects uh, for themselves and for all of the, the artists and people that they work with. Uh, so we're always excited to be able to meet such amazing artists in this amazing city. Uh, and so we want to share with you their practices. And tonight we're so excited to have with us uh, Sean Leonardo, uh, he's an artist I've known for, for many years. I've, I've followed his career and always been amazed and surprised by the work that he does. And so I'm so glad to have him here tonight. Um, so uh, we're going to start um, with the presentation by Sean um, and, and a little bit of a, a guided uh, experience. But so please hold your questions. Uh, we are on YouTube, so you'll be able to make comments. Uh, he might ask you for, for some comments at a point coming up, uh, and then we'll definitely have time to answer your questions uh, in a conversation uh, a little later in the presentation. So, uh, Sean, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, so, to, yeah. So tonight, uh, I understand that you have some some images for us, um, and and I, I'd really just love to to turn it over to you before we have a conversation to just. You know, if you wouldn't mind to, to guide us through some of your work and to try to just give us a, a deeper peek into some of the work that you've done. I know you've done work at, you know, everywhere from the Guggenheim uh, to uh, the Highline, New Museum, um, and so projects all over the place. But uh, I'd just love it if you could personally guide us through, through your sure. work. Sure. Uh, so good evening, everyone. And although I can't see your faces, I, 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 I'm sure there's a lot of love back there uh, in the virtual sphere. But before I get to sharing these images, I also want to just give a special acknowledgement to the Materials for the Arts family who I've known for over two decades since my earliest time at Socrates Sculpture Park. And I wanted to remember to uh, share that love, especially with Tara Sansoni, who first invited me into this platform. Happy to share whatever I can with anyone that is here listening to us. But I also take a moment to have a special recollection with you john that although i'm i now live and work in brooklyn that we both represented queens during the queen's museum naval battle for <laughs> um, <laughs> for oh my god what's our what's what's my man's name duke riley duke riley brother duke riley who set up the most uh outstanding absurdist performative event that quite honestly i still carry more vivid memories than much of my own work but i want to Im Im most importantly that our boat the queen's museum boat was left standing and yes. and uh remains victorious in that ridiculous gladiatorial affair bliss could you please uh put up the powerpoint So as John said, you know, before we launch into a conversation and, you know, my intention here is to open it up and really have uh, a discussion with anyone that is is out there and particularly with John. But in order to do so, it also always seems pertinent to provide a proper backdrop to the conversation. So I'm going to really a very fast overview of the work that I've dedicated myself to to about the last five or six years, maybe seven or eight. Go ahead, Bliss, please. So these first slides that you're going to view all will be centered on a program for which I serve as lead educator and for which I co-founded with Allison Weisberg at the nonprofit Brooklyn-based Recess. This is a program entitled Assembly, which functions in the diversion space. And because I never want to make assumptions as to how anyone might carry knowledge of the criminal justice system, I will give you the brief nuts and bolts. Four or five years ago, in conjunction with partners within the court, 
Recess and I created a practice for youth aged 18 to 25 who have been arrested in Brooklyn and arraigned in the downtown criminal court. Many of you may not know, but all misdemeanor charges and as of late, some felony charges qualify what is qualified as diversion or what is codified as diversion, which essentially means that a young person comes to our space rather than have their case pursued in court. And after a four week cycle of performance based visual storytelling workshops, their cases can be closed and their records sealed. The work is invested in a methodology which looks to see what happen when we remove language. And what continues to drive the work is that when the young people come in through our doors, that they have already started to self prescribe as criminal. So this work is dedicated to undoing those messages that they've gained entire life, that they are valueless and that arrest and incarceration is an inevitability. And so what we do is translate stories through very minimal performative gestures to see what kind of truth is conveyed through the body, to see how a story might be told, articulated differently through body language, because it's my argument that something at the core of the story can often be lost in words, but found in the way we express it through our body. And it's in, it's in that core emotional space that we find a different kind of truth. And it's also in that space that we push away these preexisting notions and narratives of criminal and criminality instead start to look at the humanity of an individual. The images that you're seeing here, however, are not of the program as it is conducted in entirely anonymous fashion. Instead, you're seeing an early moment in which the youth decided to share the methodology and the process with a larger audience pulling members of the audience that joined us into their memories as a way to recall them differently by having other bodies in space embody their narrative, pulling them in, having them be part of this story in order to share its responsibility and see it more clearly. Go ahead, Bliss. So I'll just go ahead and share a number of these stories. The first, or not share the stories, but share, share a number of these images because they are not my narratives to share. But in these embodied practice, moments of embodied practice, what we look at is how criminalization happens in the ways a person is pulled over in their car by the cops. Go ahead, Bliss. how it often happens in school, as in the first image, and how it often happens in the streets or in every corner. And if one individual, especially if you're a black and brown individual in the streets, is being chased by a cop, the situation and circumstances are as such that everyone has to run. Continue, Bliss, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. And so, I want to also share a few images of where this practice is rooted in by sharing some of my older performance work from a few years past. This being I Can't Breathe, dedicated to the death, the killing of Eric Garner by the hands of, hands of the NYPD. This being an immediate response to that video footage, inviting the public to what they believe to be a self-defense course. And over the course of 45 minutes, in which I really I parted actual self-defense maneuvers, I would address what they were being learned in terms of the weight of police violence, ending, of course, in the maneuver that the NYPD still refuses to call a chokehold, and inviting members of the public to embody that action, to embody the impossibility 
of truly saving oneself from that chokehold. And by alternating in the role of aggressor and victim, also understanding the complete, or I should say, really starting to feel and sense in one's own body the complete of humanity present at that scene. Go ahead, Bliss. This was a project which culminated at the Highline after four years, and I should say that I Can Breathe continued for nearly four years, both inside and outside of a traditional art context, being hosted both in art fairs and museums and galleries, but also schools, the streets, and community centers and developments. This piece entitled Eulogy that you're seeing in front of you was framed as a New Orleans jazz funeral procession in which I invited the public to collectively mourn the lives lost, lost in the past however many years young black men killed by police, the eulogy itself being taken and modified from the speech that was recited at the center of Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man, replacing every instance in which he said Brother Todd Clifton with that had been killed by the police as a remembrance, a commemoration and a call to action. And unfortunately it was, I think, 14 different times in which I was filling in a name and far too easy to fill in those names. Next, please. And the last performance piece I will share staged at the Guggenheim in 2018 for their social practice initiative, very much following the same methodology and principles of embodied practice in which I invited four distinct communities, all with unique relationship to gun violence through a separate workshop process. The four groups being the NYPD, military veterans, a group I coined citizens impacted by street violence, most often, most often that was gang affiliated violence, and a final group of firearm enthusiasts. Process of sending their experiences of conflict through their bodies. They were asked for the first time to see one another, meet one another, and reckon with one another and debate the issue of gun violence, but without the use of words, transforming the museum into a gladiatorial arena. Next, please. And now finally, I'm going to show you just a few images of drawings from a much larger body of work. Many of you may know or be aware of this work being at the center of a current controversy in an exhibition that was recently censored by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland, in which many conflicting perspectives and lots of different politics and dynamics on the ground led to the work not being shared. This in front of you being one of the earliest drawings of the Eric Garner incident. Next. Stefan Clark in Sacramento. Go ahead. And these next three drawings employing a mirror tint so that the viewer is implicated in the violence by seeing one's own image in what would have been the space of the victim's body, go ahead. And once more. And these three images being sourced from incidents that to me explained was described by the medical examiner in the killing of a young man from my own neighborhood in Queens, Forest Hills, Queens, Federico Pereira. And I'll stop on this image specifically because it was drawn about a year ago. The entire body of work employs these strategies of omission. And in some cases, emphasis of some information over another to slow down people's looking 
even in the hurt, even in the pain, because I still argue that there's something to pull from these images that we're not seeing. And quite often that is information that would selectively be overlooked. And I land on this image specifically because in recent weeks, it was called up by a number of the people that have experienced it and witnessed it in reflection of the death of George Floyd, the killing of George Floyd. Because it seemed so close to the footage. And I still don't know, quite honestly, how to deal with that comparison or the ways in which both the I Can't Breathe piece and these drawings have been called up in another moment of Black death. But I have to believe that there's a purpose in having us, in us continue to interrogate these images and see and sit with its truth, our complicity, and the ways that the media impact our collective consciousness and what we remember. And I know, you know, I don't want to speak for anyone. I'm go ahead to the last image, please, Bliss. You know, thank you for sharing this information. While this is on, on the screen, I want to speak just a little bit about the moment that we all find ourselves right now at 719 if you're in New York. I know there's been a lot of ups and downs over the last four months, and I want to acknowledge who may be on this call, educators, and what they may be experiencing as uncertainty in the very near future. I know I just received an email from my kids' schools. I have one four-year-old and a 12-year-old stepdaughter, and emails essentially preparing us for remote learning or blended learning, and Today, more so than any day this week, that feeling of hopelessness, that feeling of loss, I can only imagine is compounded for teachers who are being asked to lead, who are being asked to guide and protect our children. And so rather than continue to talk about the work, I wanted to guide us through a moment and ground us in this very moment, in where we are in physical and, and psychic space. Go ahead and stop sharing the screen, please, Bliss. And so while I can't see you, I'm going to ask all of you to find a space. And I know this might be complicated for many of us. But I'll just try to find somewhere quiet where you can be with yourself and your own thoughts. And just quickly, I'd like for you to, if you, if you can, be sitting down with your feet planted on the ground, your palms resting gently on either your knees or your thighs, your shoulders slumped however they will be, but your back straight if possible, if you can play, apply pressure to the back of your seat and your chin slightly down. And I just want us to take a few four count breaths before we contemplate something together. On your own time, a four count in, and then a four count out. For some of you, you may need to close your eyes, slightly open your mouth, or whatever it might be. Take a few breaths with me on three, two, one. On your own time, once more. One more time, please. Just flutter your eyes open if you close your eyes. And just for, for a moment, I want you to tell a story to yourself. I want you to think about a single moment over the last four months specifically during which you felt most alone. And tell yourself that story in as much visual detail as possible. 
So what I would often share in the space of assembly is that the beginning, middle, and end is unimportant in the telling of this narrative. What's most important is where you are. Think of it as a single snapshot in your mind, in your own mind. What's around you? What are you wearing? What time of day is it? Who are you with? Are you saying anything? If you're alone, what is your body doing? Is it dark? What colors are around you? Down to the most minute detail of, it, of what you can see on the wall to your left or right, or if there are cracks in the sidewalk. Give yourself the space and to just see that moment. And take 10 or 15 more seconds and just tell yourself that story. And for the sake of generosity, I will share my own story, but I won't ask anyone else to do so. But in the meantime, John, if you can open up the comments, and I'd like for anyone to share one sentence with you. I won't see these folks. This will all filter through, John, but I'd like for anyone who is willing to share one sentence describing what you were doing with your body in that very moment. So rather than tell the story, just express, convey in language what you were doing with your body. Now I'll share what comes to mind for me. It was rather early on in lockdown, my wife, my family and I actually decided to quarantine in Vermont where my wife had family. And a few days in, for reasons I'm still unsure, I woke up in the middle of the night and happened to look across and saw that I received a text message at three something in the morning to news that my mentor, Dr. David Driscoll, had passed away. And we would learn later that it was due to COVID. The next day, without really being able to speak or articulate what I was feeling, I found myself doing this. Now I can tell you what was going through my mind and, and its mental process, but I can remember that moment distinctly. Looking through the window, off to the side, sense of complete isolation. And I'll revisit this story after a few different um, comments are read. But before we even do that, John, I'm going to ask you in this sort of process of embodiment, if you could show the audience through your body in a frozen gesture with no words, a silent, still gesture, where you were in this moment, what exactly you were doing with your body. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, I can't little. see the... Yeah. Here we go. Let's go down a little bit, too. Okay, thank so you. I would have been even, like, maybe sitting on the steps, right? Okay, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just do it. All right. Just my spot, so... Let's do it. Okay, so what he would like us to know is that this is a seated position. Otherwise, I want everyone who's watching, and you may you may look off as you wish, John. For everyone just to study this gesture. And what I'd like you for you to do before you jump into meaning is to look at every piece of his body because every slip, every piece of this gesture will give us more information. And now bliss. I'm going to ask you to tell us 
what it is you see. Now be as specific as possible. Rather than tell us the story, just tell us what you interpret in this body. I think I see someone who has a lot of fear in their body. Okay. See, now what's telling you that? I think I see a tightness. Um, I see someone who's clenched up. Someone who is sort of balling up and constricting their space. Beautiful. Thank you, Bliss. John, you may unfreeze. Thank you. So let's think about precisely the words that Bliss shared with us, right? The visual language you communicated tension, balled up, but even more specifically, I forget exactly how you put it, Bliss, but closing in on one space. Right, right. Um, Think about how much that tells us about this moment. And the fact that a clenched fist here can tell us one thing. But as soon as it starts to press up against that face, in a gaze that is off, how that starts to communicate a different level of desperation. And the moment that the balling up happens, how we start to see an even childlike state, mm. the way in which that becomes a manifestation of having to protect oneself, the closing in on one space. Now, why would that be? Because what's ever happening in your immediate surroundings needs to be sheltered from. The body can tell a story. And quite often, well, let me save this. John, let's see if anyone else has just expressed anything on the chat. Man, there's a there's a there's a there's a bunch of comments, so I'll just pick a couple uh, general okay. themes here. But yeah, this is people are really responding to this. I mean, I'm seeing someone say here, um, feeling a pain in the chest, like they couldn't breathe. Okay. Um, sitting body sitting in a closed position, unmoving. Um, in bed or in the middle of the night, lying on my side, clenching my okay. teeth. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, a couple people were saying, talking about how they're seated, um, but just staring at the wall. Understood. Yeah. Now, even without seeing those, we can start to visually manifest them in our own imagination. And now, particularly in the language that's being used, when someone's saying the clenching of teeth, the staring at a wall, the ball up the pain at the center of one's chest which I that which often occurs to me even before this even before appearing on this meeting the ways in which we describe those things sounds familiar because we all have in our own experience in our own bodies been there and now, I want us to talk about this for a moment. It's maybe the first time in human history where we all have the same starting point, where we all, due to COVID and other circumstances and other threats, like the continuous racial violence that we are bearing witness to, we all have a sense of isolation. We all feel an amount of uncertainty. We all feel that pressure of the unknown. We're all disconnected from the folks that we love. And for the first time, certainly in our generation, the risk is the person, the very person next to us, our family, our friends, our neighbors. So that disconnect, that feeling of loneliness is universal. Now, I want to acknowledge that being isolated in this home 
to for whom is not the same as some of the young people that I work with that have an eight by eight space, shared space. And yet when we dial into the experience of loneliness and isolation, there's something that is universally familiar. Now think about how that all of a sudden enables some kind of connection. I have no idea who said that they felt the weight and pain in their chest. I don't even know what race, ethnicity, gender expression that this person is. And all of a sudden I know, I feel like I know who that person is because that same experience has been lodged in my chest. And I know precisely what that weight feels like. And so there's a way in which if we become more attuned to what's happening in our bodies, we find a different kind of common ground. And that is what this work is invested in. It's not into placating anyone or any subject. It's not in pushing aside the experiences that people carry with them, the burden that people carry with them the weight of personal experience, the trauma that people carry with them. But what it is, is an acknowledgement that sometimes we don't have the language to articulate these things that have occurred to us. And yet they are lodged in our body and our psyches. And sometimes the only way to share and enable that connection is to articulate it through our bodies. Because like I said, a different kind of truth can be found there. And I've seen amazing things happen with individuals when all of a sudden they're allowed to grapple and grasp their own stories, their own personal histories in this way without trying to, without being forced to explain it to themselves. Because that core truth, no one can take that away. Let's go ahead and open it up, John, or whatever you have for me. <laughs> Beautiful. Wow. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you. So such a, uh, you know, just, just, you know, uh, I never know quite what to expect. And, and to be guided through that was, was very interesting. Um, I got a lot of questions for you and I'm sure we could, we could talk a lot and, um, we will invite the audience to ask questions as well. Um, and as you know, Sean, we have a pretty um, uh, active audience in the sense that hopefully and generally a lot of the folks that tune into Materials to the Arts are people that are actively teachers and art teachers and camp counselors and artists and all this stuff, as you know. Um, so I, I have lots of questions about strategies, but, but before I get into that, um, you know, it seems to me like you kind of just, it's just, it just, you take for granted, like social practice, that's just part of your work. Like as an artist, of course, that's just what you do. But I just want to know, you know, you know, why, why does social practice, just to start, why is that to you? So just, just an essential part of this thing that we call, you know, art and artists. And just to yeah. talk a little bit about why you're so passionate about the why that has to be in there, what it means and, and what's new now and whatever, you know. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I totally want to acknowledge that people are coming at it from a practitioner's uh, point of view and are here for that type of learning. So for the sake of answering this question, and I'll do so in two different ways, I'll trace back a bit. Because, you know, it's important for people to know that I didn't go to school for this. <laughs> so I, 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 my, I, and my MFA concentration was in painting. And I continue to paint. And I, of course, was trained in, in traditional techniques of drawing, which uh, occupy a large part of my studio life. The performances first emerged the and I wouldn't have been able to articulate this at the time, but in grad school, I was manifesting very much this a very similar subject of race, definitions of masculinity. I was manifesting this subject as self-portraiture. Mm. 
And many of those early paintings took the form of plywood cutouts, which then would be mounted onto the wall. And you can see examples of this still on my website. And these were all figurative paintings. I call them paintings, even though they encompass the entire wall. And they often were these hyper-masculine icons that I was portraying myself as specifically because in the realm of pop culture, people of my skin color were excluded. And so I've referenced specific icons, figures, pop cultural, um, really characters that taught me what it, how I was supposed to be a man. Hmm. Much of that was influenced by my Latino heritage and of course the male figures in my family. The performance emerged when the paintings became inadequate mm. as an expression. And what I mean that is that the iconography could be studied and the images problematized in the pictorial painting, but there was a different kind of embodiment that was being called of me, specifically mm. because I went to, you know, I played college football. Mm. And so many of the ideals and constructions of masculinity that I was portraying in that flat work, I lived, I embodied in very complex and contradictory ways. And so it became more sincere for me to play that out in real time and real space. And what performance taught me is that there's an immediacy and a responsibility that pulls the audience in. And that continued to compel me. That continued to really drive the work. And slowly but surely, I wanted the audience to complete the work. And so it became more orchestrated. And gradually, I started to decenter myself so that the audience, in their participation, in their looking, in their movement, and all the baggage that they brought, psychological baggage that they brought to the moment, that that became the piece. I was just saying this earlier, actually, to the director, Sally, of the Queen's Museum, that I've been really thinking about and talking about my work as a rehearsal for nothing. That the rehearsal in and of itself is the power of the work. That whatever people bring to the moment is what creates the dynamic and the space of learning and the space of articulation. And so I just have become increasingly interested in that level of co-authorship, cooperation, collaboration, co-design. And, you know, the, to be honest with you, John, in the work that I do now, in that social responsibility that I carry in the subject of killings of black young men, which is close to my own experience, close to my own fear. I feel like that this practice necessarily has to bring others' bodies, other minds, other emotions into the space to fulfill the work. Because one person, I can't speak for anyone but it is in service of my community. And to do that sincerely, fully, and honestly, it just simply makes more sense for other people to create the work. And so I set across with a framework, with a philosophy, and then within that frame, whatever happens is what needs to happen. I mean, uh, personally, I think that that kind of, I guess you say, for, to me, I, I always, I see that as kind of like an ability for the artist to like almost blow out the context, you know, to say like, it could be the painting, it could be the room around the painting, it could be the city around the painting, it could be all that together. I, I find that as a, as a, just as a, someone that's looking at art to be, the stuff that gets me the most excited. Um, it hits me 
aesthetically because it just it seems so engaging but at the same time i'm a, i'm a citizen i'm a political you know everyone's i have these beliefs and it also it allows me to be, have to engage that conversation and, and and now it's it's just it's coming off the walls you know literally coming to life and i'm surprised <laughs> i'm always surprised more artists don't just leap into that head first um and I just think it's, you know, can be some of the most amazing experiences as a viewer and as a participant, you don't walk away from experiences with art like that, forgetting it, you know, it's, it's, it's visceral and it can actually change the world. Um, so I'm thankful for, for your work, you know, so, um, but I mean, so, so that being said, so now you've, you've had, you know, years to kind of experiment with it and think about it. I'd love it if you would just even just, you know, one thing you said, you know, to share some strategies, one thing you said was, um, and keep talking about, you know, the power of, of art in a way, it seems like to transcend words. And I know words can create a lot of binaries and words have, have done us wrong in lots and lots of ways. And I, and I totally agree in that, that, that power, but if maybe you could just talk a little bit, it seems like you've, you've done it in lots of different ways. Yeah, I mean, I think, and you know, what's also important to say is that while I'm only sharing the performance and social practice and the drawings in, 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 uh, in the slideshow, uh, I'm, I, I really pursue whatever the work calls for. And so sometimes that manifests itself in sculpture, in performance video, uh, in painting, certainly. I really do believe that a project will call for its form. Hmm. And as, and as an artist, that part of our, our uh, responsibility to ourselves and accountability to our work is to listen to what the project needs, which is particularly true whenever you're collaborating with any community or with any other artist for that matter, or in my case, with systems of power. Now, in terms of language, I often address my work in the context of the failure of language. And that leads me to the various strategies depending on what the project calls for. And so, you know, to revisit something that I said earlier in the performance-based work, and which, is, which is still embedded in the social practice, what I often say is, if I were to ask, to give an example of primitive games, if I were to ask any members of those group affiliations to debate the issue of gun violence. How do you think that would have come? I have seen what we are seeing. I do frankly believe that what I'm about to say worsened during the Trump era. But what we see is that affiliations and individuals across and any argument have learned to come to a debate with their speaking points already rehearsed. Words, the argument becomes a process of proving oneself right, but that is not communication. Failed before it's even begun. Hmm. And so what I try to do through this methodology and various techniques is force individuals and groups to rely on a different device. Because the language that comes forth is often something that has passed down and then is recited without true intentionality. But you can't lie through your body. It's much harder to deceive someone with your body. You could be saying something and it could be actually betrayed by your body language. And I'll, you know, this is a complete side note. Um, <laughs> but since it's, since it's occurring to me, I'll just share it. I'll just share it with you because I think it's important to the work, particularly, and even to the drawing work. And you'll understand why in a moment. For a larger project that I, I, I'm involved in entitled In Plain Sight, and this is a good time to also bring up the uh, Black Immigrant Bail Fund, mm. for which I'm dedicating my fee to. The Black Immigrant Bail Fund, which is dedicated to Black immigrants that are in, currently in ICE detention, many of whom are awaiting trial and therefore are there simply because they cannot afford bail. The, the Black Immigrant Bail Fund is one of a coalition of bail funds 
by grassroots organizations that are fighting ICE detention across the country. And I was one of 80 artists aligned with the mission called In Plain Sight, which many of you hopefully saw over the 4th of July weekend, there being phrases written in the sky by airplanes, bringing a to the vast number of ICE detention sites in this country, quite often invisible, but in plain sight, if you chose to look. And so there were a number in this particular reason, ICE detention centers in Jersey, upstate New York, New York City. My own phrase, which, which read, to be human, was skywritten above Rikers on July 6th. And more importantly, the artists collaborated with many of these organizations that you can find on xmap.us to really bring attention to their efforts. And therefore, there were activations on the ground at many of the detention sites so that those on the inside felt our presence and so that we could bring much more awareness to the injustices of what's happening on the inside. That is a really far tangent to get back to what was already an anecdotal tangent, <laughs> but important. No, to there's so much to tell. Part. There's too there's much, so to, much tell. to tell. But in setting up my own project, I went to, uh, went to Rikers under the impression and the assumption that Rikers Island is public space. Why should it not be? There's a public bus that goes to the visitation center. I simply hopped on the bus. Of course, visitation is canceled due to COVID. So it may be surprised individuals on the other side when they saw a civilian just happening to be there. But as I looked around, and to be honest, I had really no plans of creating an activation at Rikers because I knew of its complications and because I knew of um, the inability of people to gather there. And so I went for my own sake to sort of imagine the writing above my head. Probably about five minutes in, I was surrounded by officers, simply for my presence. And because as they stated, taking photos, which I was doing, was not permitted. Now I did not see a single sign that said photos were not permitted. And now surrounded by five officers encroaching on my space, and, but, and of course, one false move as in using their language, and that could have gone incredibly badly for me. But because of my work, I was able to sense both the agitation and panic in my body and slow down. And when the first officer approached me with a loud voice, essentially telling me and uh, dictating what I should do and should not do. There was a moment that I saw for myself how badly this could have could go. And as he was shouting to me, there was something because I paused. There was something that I saw. This man in front of me was terrified. Now think of all the embodied fear that officers carry when they approach a man of color. And the training and egotism that is coupled with that. If I addressed it on those terms, I would have been violated. And yet because I saw that fear that so often leads to an officer dehumanizing a person of color. They've been ingrained with the fear of a black person and that leads to our death. And, but I saw that and because I was able to sense that body language and because it was familiar to me, I was able to pause, breathe and stop, which very well, could have saved me, I don't know. 
And now this is not an excuse because I should be able to react however I wish, especially when I feel like things used on me unjustly. But I want us all to think about how that moment goes because his fear of my appearance, my personhood, is given the leverage of power and a firearm in a holster. And I could go on and on, John, but now I've taken up lots of time. <laughs> no, to me, to me, you're, you're, you're just, you know, putting, again, utilizing this, you know, we're all lonely right now and you're, 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 you're jumping through the fourth wall a little bit of this digital interface to try to, you know, what I'm experiencing is a little bit of that, a feeling, you know, this, this, this humanity and this ability that, you know, poetry and art and, and storytelling and all this stuff embody, it's, 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 impo it's, it's essential. Um, uh, I, I got it. So I have a question from someone here um, from the, actually it looks like from the Flushing Town Hall. Their question is, you know, how would you suggest an arts organization could start to uh, explore these conversations with staff, artists, and audiences? Okay, by conversations, I want to make an assumption that that is in regards to the subject of my work. So police violence, racism, internalized racism. Yes, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I will share, so I sit on a number of different boards and have relationships with a number of different organizations. And I will tell you all what I've told the people that I collaborate with and who I hold accountable. You cannot even create the space in that organization to hold those conversations unless you reckon with your own, if you, unless you reckon with the whiteness in your own, in your own institutional makeup. So knowing that this is Flushing, and I'm from Queens, and I know Flushing Town Hall as a space I've been, I understand that there's a diverse constituency and also that likely there's diversity and measures of inclusion amongst the staff and the board. But what I'm telling you is that the work starts itself. And so I recommend anti-racism training for every org as the starting point, because any decisions that you make without it, any decisions that you make without assessing and grappling with the ways white supremacy and its values have infiltrated your organization will lead to programming and decisions that are just flat and surface level. I know there's a there were, I'm digging a little deep here. Do you have any specific um, groups that you recommend? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, the People's Institute. I would re highly recommend that as a training. And there are various types of training that they offer organizations depending on the diversity of its staff and the starting point of the conversation. Um, so I'll leave that on the table. Uh, you know, it just makes me think, you know, it, it's, a lot of your work strikes me to to come from the tradition of like Paolo Freire um, and using, would you say that's the case or did Absolutely. it come organically kind of like you just got into it and then you realized that there was a thread and then kind of. Yeah, you know, that's probably the most explicable way. I think I probably fell into it based on the things that I was doing and the interests that I was sort of gravitating toward. But since, particularly because I work with some of the most vulnerable populations in the city and in the country for that matter, I've become, I've held myself accountable to the nature, promise and difficulty of the work. And so I've taken a close study of somatics, the principles of theater of the press certainly, but also cognitive therapy, the behavioral sciences, these are all things that I try to be very attuned to and many of my much of my work has led me to conversations with practitioners entrenched in fields well outside of art which is what really excites me the way that art can both infiltrate these spaces but also start to overlap in ways that are are not never planned you know 
Yeah. I mean, to me, it just shows how the art, how powerful art can be. I mean, to be, you know, so I, well, I have a, so I have a, um, just a general thought, which is that, um, you have a practice, you, you're, you're, you're thinking about humanity, it seems like in terms in, in interaction and in, in aesthetics, like an artist, you know, in, in many different ways. Um, but yet in this time right now, you know, 2020, um, it seems like today you're embroiled in specifically constantly representing, you know, social justice practices almost like on a daily basis. Like you're, you're fully wrapped up in it. It seems like, um, how, and, and, and I'm sure that's just citizenship, right? That's just, just part of being a citizen. But it seems like, um, I don't know if there's just any conversations you can have for people. I mean, you talked about this idea of when you're approached, you know, relaxing and kind of thinking about that. Um, do you just, do you have any thoughts for people in terms of, um, you know, some, so they, they, maybe they would work with some of these, you know, with a group or maybe they would, think about some some practices any other advice just any other feedback you could get yeah. specifically in that respect hmm. i mean you face difficulty yeah. just trying to teach people about it so i know yeah, it's a of course bit yeah no i mean that that pause is in um uh, you know i'll be very honest with you john the, the very thing that entered my mind upon this question is is really my wish uh i don't know that i would wish this per this type of work on anyone it's so incredibly draining it's so incredibly and at times just eats away at your soul because you know you think about my work that is you know and in, 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 in an intervention in the system of uh, in the justice system specifically that is a battle which there are very few wins mm. and so you walk and you move forward knowing that the system will do everything in its power to maintain itself and that the individuals within that system believe that they are doing their job justly and so you chip, you chip, and you move, and you find ways that art asks questions that no one else is asking. And then you find the wedge, and you follow it, and then that closes, and then you have to maneuver differently. And it's all about saving fucking lives. <laughs> so I have to take some joy, and I have to be able to sleep at night knowing that Whatever I'm doing is contributing to someone not simply surviving, but existing as fully as possible. And that's my goal in any of my work. And I never, never in a million years think that I would have arrived at this type of practice. But it's like precisely what you've named as a citizen, as a person of color who's with, who's, you know, who lives with these issues in my backyard with a young daughter, I, it seemed entirely hypocritical for me to continue my practice in any other thing. Hmm. Right on. So my advice to young artists, and it was interesting, I was just someone from my alma mater, a young artist is having very struggles of, of how to create space and in, in, in her language, how to just breathe in this overly, predominantly, I should not say predominantly, like very white institution, the college that I went to, Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, and wanting to apply art as a strategy to create that space. And the first thing I said to her, and this is what I'll say to anyone else, don't take on the burden and responsibility for anyone else until you've taken care of yourself. Because that work has to serve you mm. as fuel and has to situate you in your life with care 
and integrity. And until you are feeding yourself, until you are creating safety for yourself, you cannot do this work and don't attempt it. And, and I think that the, the, the very fact that you're, you're creating dialogue, you know, is, is so meaningful to me in, in the sense of instead of going to someone and, and just like, you know, having a sign and saying here, it's like you're, you're creating this dialogue. But that in and of itself is it's rough, you know, rough waters. Um, so thank you for the work you do, because we need people to do that because, you know, People are getting murdered in our streets that don't need to be. There's still slavery in our country when you look at our jails and the way that they're set up. And so you're right. It's hard for any citizen to sit back and 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 not do something. So thank you. You know, yeah. um, I, I just got a question here. Someone Please. said, um, would you consider working with the police department in a consciousness raising capacity? You know, or, or it, it, a lot of conversations right now about you know, changing policing practices. And I know you've worked, you know, thought extensively about corrections, just any thoughts in general, not that you have to solve the whole system. Yeah, you know, and I have, I have um, conducted work with officers and in, in, in the recent past and was very close in conversations um, with the NYPD about enacting work that would have been the first of its kind in the country, actually. Can't be too public about it, can't share too publicly. The question, however, is specifically about conscious raise, consciousness raising, hmm. which brings me to a philosophical crisis um, and one in which, I, which uh, will not permit me to give you an answer. Where we are now and where I sit today, what I know, my insight in working with the NYPD and even what I'm about to well destabilize the work that you know I've done or what might or might attempt to do. Keep it together here. Don't give me <laughs> yeah, I don't fully what do I want to say? I think questions of whether reform is valid. And let me say that differently. I think questions that are being brought up in the movement to defund the NYPD and the movement for racial justice in questioning whether reform is possible are incredibly valid. Because that what I know in my workings is that you can turn hearts within that system, but in its foundation, in its mechanics, and in the way it operates on a day-to-day -day basis, officers only have one mandate. And that is to contain and control. I don't know where I stand yet in any collaboration with NYPD. Because I think, to be very honest, the work might be calling me to move into a different direction. All right. Well, thank you for that. And uh, I'm sure the adventure will continue uh, in that respect. I just add to that by saying, I say that knowing and having experienced incredible change with officers. Hmm. And yet the system, and I can go on about this for hours, the system that is in place only seeks to dehumanize people in my community. I don't know that I trust reform. Uh huh. Okay, that's a. I mean, I think that that's that's. There's I. I, I don't. Know, I agree with you. Um, 
<laughs> so, now you be careful because you have you're representing an organization, a city organization. No, listen. I mean, to be no, but listen. To be honest with you, I am representing you know the taxpayers in New York City, and I'm representing sure. Materials for the Arts. And the goal of Materials for the Arts is to advocate for the arts to be you know create a better New York, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, I, I got a question here from um, Mass Mocha. Uh, oh, really? Okay. It's Laura from Mass Mocha. She's, she's, she's saying, do you think it's possible for museums, you know, and I understand you're saying these institutions, but she's, she's saying, you know, in what way do you think it's possible for museums to change um, given the current climate? Or is it too big of a question that we'll look at over the next years together? I think there are immediate steps and then there are longer term steps and the, the, the longer term steps address much larger looming questions in terms of who these institutions want to be. And Laura and I are close, so we've had very, you know, very much of these conversations regarding these philosophical questions, but the immediate work has everything to do with how museums are seeing themselves in terms of the care of their immediate communities.